Good afternoon. You're watching the ROAR webinar series. I'm Josefina Oniga, and with us is Dr. Lisa Coleman. Dr. Coleman, hi. Hi, how are you? It's nice to see you. <laughs> you look nice and refreshed. I know you just got back from a nice vacay. I did. I did a little staycay in, uh, in my other house, and so it was nice to have a staycation. You know, it's still just me and the puppy, but at least it's in a different location. Yes, it's it's really nice. I actually just got back from Puerto Rico. I was you there. did. I was there for a few days. You look very sun kissed. I was wondering about that. Yeah. 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 It was so nice. I I didn't want to come back. Mm, I, I bet you recognize did. how much I love Puerto Rico and love being home and this is phenomenal, actually. So I, I bet it I bet it, I, I bet it was. How long were you there? Um, I was there for four days. Okay. okay. Enough time to check on my family and check up on things that I have there pending. And How is your family? They're good. They're good. Of course, you know, what I was surprised about was um, the level of security they have for people coming in from outside the island. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I had gotten a test, obviously, to to fly there, and I didn't think they were going to even ask me. So I printed it out last minute, mm -hmm. the results. And when we got there, there were like ten hazmat people walking wow. around. Wow! Wow! And unless you had proof, they wouldn't let you in. Wow! Well, yeah. that's that's something to know, right? I mean. That's good to know. It was pretty good you, good. you printed it out. Thank goodness. That's what I was thinking is I initially didn't think they were going to ask. And then every place that we went. Um, so, of course, you know, you're there. You have to go to stores to, to buy things. And before you even walk in the store, they're spraying your hands and you have to wear a mask. So you can't come in the store at all. And uh, it was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I uh, I was in Massachusetts, as I said, and um, and in Massachusetts, it's really interesting. I've been just paying attention to how people are, you know, culturally, 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 culturally. So that froze a little bit, but it was kind of funny, actually. So, um, for right, some even when sorry, Lisa, for some reason, um, you're Am I frozen. Yeah, you're frozen. Am I What's... still frozen? No, not anymore. But whatever you were saying, it was so funny because it was almost like... <laughs> a robot. <laughs> it was. It was good. It was funny. So let's get let's get started with the topic of the day. Yes. Um, you know, we've we've talked about ERTs, we've talked about strategy. Maybe um, we can talk about some of the themes that we've been hearing out there that seem to be popping up. Definitely, I've seen more and more jobs. Yes, yes. I have to say, I mean, I don't know if anyone is scouring the um, both the LinkedIn pages, um, whether it's Monster. Or or, uh, you know, if you have the alert set on your phone and you put chief yeah. diversity officer in and you do it through the Google alerts or whatever for positions, um, I do that because I just like to track positions nationally. I'm interested in what is emerging, where is it emerging, how is it emerging? So I have a lot of those trackers. Sometimes people think I have those trackers because I'm trying to get another job, but I just, I just went into this role uh, three short years ago. So, um, so no, but it's, it's been really interesting to see that both the level of the roles as well as the number of roles. Plus the other, other uh, important factor that I've been noting, like you, I keep track of these things as well because I find them interesting. But I also look at the number of companies that are putting press releases out oh, for yeah. hires that, you know, um, in the past, when companies have put press releases on uh, or out there, it has been for C-level positions. Mm -hmm. 
what I've seen or the, the trend that I've been seeing is for DNI positions that maybe are uh, manager director level positions. Yes. Yes. Their press release is big, you know, this, they're doing this. So it kind of, in some ways, it sends a little red flag out to me because it's almost yeah. like a check mark. I'm glad that they, they have somebody that they've brought someone in. But on the other hand, I'm like, you know, not a CDO. Yeah. Um, you know, it's great. Yeah, that, and it's really concerning, Josefina. It's really concerning. And, and I'm seeing more and more roles that are, say, CDO also, but then they don't report in the C-suite. They report to an operational manager, or they still report into HR. And one of the things that I've said about CDO roles is, I mean, I think reporting into HR can be fine for part of the role, but what we really have to think about is diversity and inclusion is about transforming the organization, not just talent management, right? And so if you put it in HR, then you're really just thinking about more often than not, recruitment and sometimes retention strategies, but often not. But then you're not thinking about the entire right organizational strategy, your stakeholders, your fiscal, right, your fiscal consumption and your consumers. How are you doubling down on diversity and inclusion in those areas? And how are you using the person that you've hired? So if you just situate it within one functional area, and I'll I'll just use this, this example, I've used it a lot. In the old days, we used to think we couldn't, we didn't have to hire chief information officers, right. CIOs, right? We just thought everybody could have their computers or their databases, and then we could have a middle manager here and there kind of managing that. Well, that didn't work. That didn't work at all, actually. Right. It was a mess, as you and I both know. Yeah. And so what we had to do was hire CIOs to develop strategy, to think about the architecture right, of the information systems. You had to think about all of the ways that technology was interfacing across your organization. And this is similar to the diversity and inclusion and equity efforts. How is it working across the entire organization, not just within one portal or one unit or area? You know, it reminds me also of the marketing role, right? Marketing transcends all departments. That's right. That's right. It transcends all departments, and, and really, that's what DNI is, or D D I N E. Um, and you know, it's funny that you say that because someone said recently, a, a friend of mine uh, who works at Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal, and she said this. She said, you know, some diversity officers in the past, or the new new people who don't understand the context, sometimes will say. Oh yeah, well I'm, you know, I'm going to solve the diversity issues and problems, and then I'll work myself out of a job. That is the strangest thing I've ever heard. Marketing professionals don't go in and say, "I'm going to market myself out of my job," right? And so, and and, and diversity and inclusion experts are not solving problems, right? They're creating innovation and solutions and new platforms and practices and policies, and so just like the CIO or the CMO, we are working to build capacity within the organization. And that- Sorry, I have, sorry, I have two comments on that, right? Um, working, I heard somebody say that as it related to marketing. They said, you know, we don't need to market because we've got more customers than we can do deal with. And recently there were big issues happening for them, but it's the same thing, right? How could you say that? You have to always work it. Um, <laughs> that's one thing, but I'm going to ask you a controversial question. Okay. And then we have a question from the audience. So if okay. you don't, if, and it's controversial. So I'm ready. You ready. I'm ready. I think. <laughs> All right. So one of the questions that I got um, via email is, do you think that an Anglo person can take the role <laughs> of a CDO? Okay. <laughs> Just cheesy. I had to do the little camera off for a moment. Just that was good. That was good. Was I like it. That's perfect. Um, that's like dot, dot, dot. Right, it's like, exactly. <laughs> the answer is boom, 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 boom. Yes, but, <laughs> but, right? 
I think that what we have to think about with the CDO role is, right, the CDO role is about expertise. It's not about identity, right? So it's about, do you have the expertise? And some of that expertise, it does come from a knowledge base that far too often we've dismissed as inconsequential. And some of that can be experiential, right? So right. that you've learned to navigate certain things and then you can help others navigate, right? So I think that is the component right those are the components what kind of expertise and also if you're a chief diversity officer and you're anglo how are you building capacity for people of color how are you building if you're a man how are you could build the capacity for women right if you are um, a non a, a person who does not have a disability myself how are you building capacity for persons with disabilities and where are you expanding your expertise so i knew sign language when i was younger so right now i'm starting to double down and relearn sign language right because that's important for someone like me to expand my experience and my expertise so that i'm actually developing that for communities that i'm not part of Right. And that's what you have to do. And you have to do it over and over and over again, particularly if you are not a member of a marginalized uh, population. And I say that because the reality is and, you know, we don't we don't like to we don't like to think this, but the reality is there is racism, there is sexism, there is xenophobia. These there is ableism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and all those things. And as a result, right, those experiences teach you resilience and chops and things, and you learn things through that, that you might, you might have to learn in another way. And so the question is not just your ex expertise in terms of reading books and doing that, but what's the expertise in helping to navigate and find, as I said earlier, the important solutions. Let me ask you this. Uh, did you ever take uh, marketing classes there or public relations class? I did take marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. Great Deep answer. answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we we have a question that had popped up a second ago. And um, uh, she says, Dorotha says, I have applied for positions and shortly thereafter, the same position is advertised as a new position. I wonder if the position is really available. Maybe some companies are building their pipelines, question mark. What do you think about that? So she's applied for a position. Obviously, uh, from the message, maybe they haven't followed through on, on, on the application. And now she's seeing the position again available. You know, to her point, we're talking about PR and the way that companies are uh, putting out press releases when they hire uh, folks that are managers, directors for a position. I wonder, too, if that's also an attempt on classifying their companies as really embracing diversity and inclusion. Absolutely. Absolutely. The statements, the, the statements, the ways in which a lot of these companies are trying now to, now I wanna give credit to some of the companies that have been doing work all along and they sort of dusted off and polished their statements up. That's one thing. But for those who are just entering into the conversation, the question is how are they entering into the conversation? And of course, I do know that there are real fiscal implications right now. So lots of companies are having fiscal troubles. And so the question is, how are they investing in their diversity and inclusion and equity efforts? So I have seen some, um, some companies have to re-morph or reimagine their uh, CDO role as a result of the fiscal implications, right? So maybe they had to halt and then start again, but that's different. And then to your point, how are you communicating, right? That start and stop pause internal to your company, but also external. Because the other thing I would like to say is that a lot of us, a lot of the diversity and inclusion professionals, we know each other. Right. So if your company just keeps advertising and re-advertising without any explanation, either internally or externally, then we won't recommend the, the most qualified. We won't recommend those people who we think are the best in the field. Then you'll be up to left to your own devices. And so, right. And so I think that really engaging in that conversation, engaging in, the, in that communication is crucial actually to getting the most qualified and to building capacity. And then I'll answer the last part is, 
Yes, some companies are trying to build their pipeline and that's okay. It's okay to build a pipeline, but you have to say that and be intentional and say that we are also using our recruiting strategies to build databases and pipelines. And although we may not contact you for this position, we will keep your resume or your information on file for two years, three years, whatever the database I like right that. now. I like that. Yeah, that it, it must be tough, right? Because you're thinking, you know, you, you spend time and effort putting an application used and then you hear nothing and then you get see that same position being advertised later. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. I think that, sorry, my camera got a little unstable. I think that's not- <laughs> I thought you were, you know, doing that. <laughs> no, that's absolutely right. When you see the same position advertised, right, you wonder, all right, what is going on? Why didn't they at least, even if they're not interested in you, right, we need concrete communication. And I think in the diversity, inclusion, and equity area, that communication and transparency is needed even more, right? Because the default is then there's something amiss. Because for many companies, there have been things amiss. So the default is not just putting things in arbitrarily. It's putting things in because a lot of companies have really struggled with this. So same, same um, following the thread of this question, if I am applying for that job, I don't hear anything, and then I see it reposted, does it make sense for me to reapply for the position? Maybe kind of, maybe there's a question that I need to change my resume a bit or my cover letter mm -hmm. to address. I wouldn't address the fact that I applied for the role before, but does that make sense to reapply for those? Absolutely. Absolutely, because sometimes what happens is the company or the organization is also looking for something. They don't exactly know what they're looking for sometimes. And that shifts and morphs depending on the leadership often. So if you also, if you have a shift in leadership, you also might see a position reposted later because then the leadership has reimagined, even though the job description might seem very much the same, but but what's behind the job description. And I always say as much as you can, do as much homework as possible. Call someone, find someone, talk to the HR person, find someone within the company, whatever it is, or external to the company who are peers, who know the company, because that can help you get some information about not just where the company is in terms of their diversity and inclusion journey, but where they are with these particular roles that they're posting. Now, Lisa, have you, um, have you heard or uh, experimented yourself with this notion of tracking companies and if they've had issues with diversity and inclusion, those are the ones that you kind of decide that you want to pursue, right? Because those are kind of like uh, low-hanging fruit, what they That's say. absolutely right. Fruit. Look, anytime there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's like a national something, and let's say, let's just say company X, I'll use Blockbuster since they don't exist and you know I love using them. Yeah. So let's say Blockbuster got in trouble and then they needed someone. So what I do on LinkedIn is I just email their CEO and their HR person and I say, hi, how are you? And then I just list my title and see if they call. So is there a place, this is for folks that are uh, currently online or on Zoom, um, is there a place that you can get a detailed list of the companies that have been hit for discriminatory, discriminatory actions against them? I wish there were, but unfortunately that's not... <laughs> <laughs> no, there isn't. Oh. That was. No, there's not. It's not compiled in that way. Now, across organizations, so places like Corn Ferry, other places will say, you know, the best companies and the worst companies, quote unquote, for diversity and inclusion, for sure. But the state, the state department, or well, the least. state department does it as well because you have to file as a company, right? Your E one data. But the problem is that's not. It is public but it's not public in that not a lot of people know how to access that and it's not published in an ongoing way that's accessible to your average, you know, Joe. So for me, Joe or Jane. So for me, I know how to access that information because, you know, I used to run affirmative action offices and OEO and offices of equal opportunity. So I know how to go into those data and really access and figure out what's going on. But the problem, and I say this, and it's, you know, some companies, every company wants to put their best foot forward. Yeah. So when you're filing those data, 
you're you're filing about people, but you're also filing about programs, et cetera. So you're putting your best foot forward. And so right. sometimes that data isn't exactly um, as well, accurate as it could be. I was thinking, you know, out of the box, if you could have access to some of that data, then you have a list of potential companies that you may need your expertise. That's and absolutely that true applying like uh, for jobs that are already available and are there's 20, 30 other people, applicants. Yes, and if you can get that data before it hits the New York Times, before it hits the Guardian, before they wind up right with the big reputational peer issue. Exactly. Right, then you can get in there and do some really good work. I actually know someone who just is doing this. She just joined a company that's had, shall we say, some historical difficulties. And after, did she join app? Did she join by researching it? She joined by she researching it. So she was aware that they had some issues even 15 years ago. And then recently they've had some issues that haven't hit the press nationally in the way that they would. She just discovered this because she was doing some consulting in the same sort of industry field. So she discovered this and then she took them on as a client and now she's their CDO. So I, I have also firsthand experience with uh, on a, in a different way, I um, had knowledge that a company was struggling with this. And when I was with Color, I made appointments with them and I said, I know you're struggling with this. And sure enough, they were one of our clients for a long time. Well, you think about it this, when you think about a request for, for, po for proposals, an RFP, right? Yeah. The difference between an RFP to get um, you know, someone to come in and help you with your IT or something like that, that's one thing. But when you put in an RFP for, oh my gosh, excuse my language, that shit is hitting the band. <laughs> right? That's really hard to do, right? And so you really often are trying to figure out exactly, you're reading the trends, right? You're reading the trends of what's happening. So if I'm in an industry or a field, I'm in higher education, but if you're in banking, if you're in marketing, if you're in IT, if you're in libraries, if you're in entertainment and media, you read the trends and I'll give you a, a good trend right now. For those people entered, ent uh, interested in entertainment and media. That's me. What, what, what? Trending, trending. Diversity and inclusion is trending. They need all kinds of people in marketing, diversity, um, communication strategies, right? Who are nimble and agile enough so that if they're in communications or marketing or business and operations, that they also can integrate the diversity and inclusion functions with the CDO, who's probably gonna be planning that, right? So I'm saying now also, even if you're not a CDO, if you're a marketing professional, a communications professional, particularly, right, business operations, we're seeing HR, we're seeing the alignment of that with diversity and inclusion and equity professionals. So if you're looking for, you know, those opportunities, this is the time. I like it. I like it. So let's talk. We only have a few minutes left. Um, I know our time always goes by so quickly. Oh. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, maybe some of the new trends that you're seeing out there that are coming, because I, I know people are starting to gravitate back to work. Mm -hmm. They are. And I saw in the New York Times this morning that uh, there's nine pharmaceutical companies that have already gotten their approval to go to clinical trials. That's right. So that means that, you know, a vaccine is... is um, coming soon, right? On the horizon. Exactly. Yeah. So um, what can a DNI person or the CDO expect that, what changes should they expect when they go back? Mm -hmm. I think that, right, uh, when we go back to the offices, obviously, we, even with the vaccine, the initial stages will still be a transition, right? So we won't see people gathering in the ways that we have. But I also think that what we've learned in this moment is we've seen the decrease in travel. We've seen the decrease in large gatherings. And so some of that will remain. 
And what I mean by that is, no, we won't stay totally remote. No, we like each other too much. Well, and we dislike each other too much. Yes. Sometimes we just want to fight in person, but we, right. And so, so we won't be remote, you know, all of our lives, but we will be more remote than we were before. So how do diversity and inclusion and equity professionals and experts ensure that this the, that the remote learning continues to be accessible. How do we build on capacity and technology and innovate new kinds of practices in DEI that are built on technology platforms, whether that's AI or robotics or whatever it is. Also, how are we going to think about how are we so I'll give one example that has been super interesting is that NYU, one of the things that we developed was a guideline. So that as people return to work, we actually developed a diversity and inclusion and equity guideline to give people information. So as you return to work, here's some, here's some information about masks. Here's some information about the differential impact, right, of Zoom on neurodiverse communities. Here's some information about how like signs that are in color might have differential impact on men because a lot of men are colorblind. So if you develop right, a diversity toolkit that you share right across your organization, so people keep asking, how can I make sure that the diversity, inclusion, and equity principles, et cetera, are still embedded, develop the guidelines, develop the documents, shop and it through your C-suite, shop it through your HR policy development, and then shop it across your organization. How do you think this is also going to change ERG groups? Yes. I think what we're going to see are ERG groups focused on disruption. So we're going to see ERG groups focused on disruption, focused on anti-racism, focused on action, right? Before what we used to see a lot of were ERG groups, uh, many of them were affinity groups and support groups, right? But now what we're going to see is those groups leveraged, hopefully within the organizations through HR, through business operations, how are our business operations? How can we be more effective with particular constituency groups? How can we anticipate disruptions with particular, whether it's constituency groups, generations, right? If we're talking to our younger generations, maybe we can anticipate the protest before it happens, right? So these are the things, these are the ways in which we can engage, right? I think ERGs, and our diverse constituents in ways that we haven't before. And I believe those are the companies that will thrive. You know, what, what's interesting is it's hearing you say that it's almost like going full circle because the beginning of the ERGs was in direct response to what was happening um, in the 60s, right? That's right. Uh, and the Xerox company was the first company to develop ERGs and it was uh, created as a way to have a safe space for their employees to talk about the challenges they were having externally That's and how exactly it impacted right. their work, right? And so it's almost coming back full circle because now we're focused on the external factors that impact or internal worlds. That's exactly right. And what we're seeing also are the emergence of ERGs that are not just identity focused, right? But are focused on, as I said, actions, plans, policies, development. And I think that, right, is um, if we think about the ERG evolution, the journey that we're seeing it, th them evolve into something, and we've talked about this in lots of companies, the business case or BRGs, right? Business right. resource groups and that link to mission and business. And I think that's what we, I, I hope that's what we will see as we move forward. Well, wow, that's gonna, it, it's gonna, um, I've seen a lot of invitations uh, for groups within companies that are inviting external uh, stakeholders to have some say in what's going on with their companies. Uh, so I find that too also very interesting, the engagement of external folks. Absolutely. What's going on. Are you seeing that as well? I absolutely am. And I think it's really, I think it's really crucial, right? The ERGs are developing programs, um, bringing in consultants, right? Really beginning to, to help the company see those things. And so I, I can't underscore it enough. I think um, stakeholder development, external partnerships, and I've said this, I think before, it helps because we organizations exist in relation. Right, so we're thinking about our peers also. And so thinking about those peers helps us to develop. 
Wonderful. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. As always, I want to remind our audience that October 15th is the ROAR uh, Virtual Conference 2.0. Uh, Amelia Seja from Seja Vineyards has agreed to keynote. Um, and we have a few other folks uh, on the panel. Lisa, Dr. Coleman is going to moderate. So I'm excited to hear that. You always have a as a matter of fact, there's a, a parameter, right? Uh, folks that are really good. And I think you're one of the best moderators. Um, Thank you for saying that. I, you know, I really, I tried to polish up my moderating skills. <laughs> <laughs> I have stolen some of your technique when I moderate panels because I, I think you're one of the best. So I'm looking forward to join you joining us. Uh, and I'm looking forward to everyone here joining us. Again, October 15th, it's on our website, Write Media. Uh, and if you didn't get an email from us, you should have uh, signed up for our email and we'll send it your way. But thank you for joining us. And Lisa, thank can you. you jump back in? Yes. Okay, super. We'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye.